What's up, boys and girls? It's good to see everybody. Uh, Jackie and Jason, come on down. You guys say hi to Jackie and Jason Stroud. Uh, they've decided to place membership with the Crossings. So welcome. We're glad you're here. I'm going to give that to you. Here you go. I'm going to give that one to you. All right, you guys can have a seat. We are really glad you guys are here. Uh, we have been really thrilled to get to know the Strouds here lately and are happy that they're making the decision to join us. Uh, so we want to celebrate that today. If you're visiting here for the first time, I want to give you a very special welcome. We are the Crossings Church Collinsville. Uh, we started this church back in 2017 to uh, show people what God is like here in Collinsville. And we are trying our best uh, just to get to know people and share the gospel of Jesus because we believe God is good and the best life you can have is found in connection to him. Amen? Amen. So if you want to have a good life, who in here wants to have a good life? Does anybody in here just want to have a terrible life? Raise your hand if you want to have a really bad life. You, want to be, you just want to be suicidal all the time, right? Nobody wants that, right? You want to have a good life. What we have a hard time believing sometimes is that God is the path to that good life. What we have a hard time believing sometimes is that the Bible can be trusted, and if we follow it, it's actually going to lead to something good. What we have a hard time believing sometimes is that there's a God in heaven who's out for our good. Guys, every single command that God gives us, you want to know why he gives it to us? For our good. Have you ever thought about that? Even the stuff that doesn't make sense. Have you guys ever, in your walk with God, have you ever encountered a command that just absolutely did not make sense to you? Who in here? Anybody? Okay. Am I the only one? Seriously? I have read my Bible, and I have thought, that is dumb. You're not supposed to say that in church, are you? Has anybody else ever thought that? You've read it and thought, that's kind of silly. Why would God expect that, right? Let me tell you, if God says it, it's for our good. If God commands it, it's for our good. You want to have a good life? Do what God says. Amen? Amen. Are you guys sure? Yeah. Okay. We're going we're gonna to talk through this now. It's going to be okay. We're going to go for a ride. How many of you guys are watching The Chosen? How many in here? Okay. I want to see next week, if I ask you how many of you are watching The Chosen, I want to see a lot more hands than that go up. Because, here's, let me tell you why. Who in here knows what The Chosen is? If you haven't watched it, you know what it is. It's free. It's a show, a TV show about Jesus and his disciples, and it's free. If you've not heard of it yet, Google it. Because you can get an app and you can watch this show that, in my opinion, is one of the best television productions that's ever been made about Jesus and his followers. It's really, really good. Now, they, they take some liberties because you have to to make a story, but I'm telling you, as somebody that knows the history uh, and that knows the culture and that knows uh, the Bible, I can tell you that what they're putting out there is really good. And it's the story about Jesus and his disciples, and one of the things that if you start watching that show, you will realize is that racism is nothing new. It is ancient. Prejudice is nothing new. Because in the first century in the Bible, when we read uh, the Gospels, when we read about Jesus and his disciples, you guys need to understand, when we open up the passage, of, when we open up the Bible and start reading it, we're reading about guys that are living in a racist culture. Back when Jesus and his disciples were walking the earth. They lived in a society that was ruled by the Romans, and the Romans were primarily one race, you know, they were primarily Italians, and they subjugated everybody else. Now, if you look at history and look at the way civilizations function, throughout history, typically when a kingdom is in power, it's typically one group of people that's running everything. You guys ever notice that? If you look at history, it's typically one race, one ethnic group, one nationality, and then everybody else is kind of subjugated. That's the way it was in the first century with the Romans. They were in charge, and everybody else was just kind of under their foot. It was, it, was, it was like that. Now, there are some parallels today, guys, in our country. Primarily, it's white men that are in charge in the United States. And it's, that's the way it's been, and that's the way it's probably always going to be. And all the other races, all the other different colors, have 
traditionally been kind of subjugated in our society. Uh, and that's, that's the way it has been. Guys, that's, that's the way it is here. But that again, that is the way it has been everywhere. Typically, in a nation, there is one group of people that has the power and everybody else does not. That was the way it was in the first century. I like the way that comes through in The Chosen because you're able to see the tension that exists between the Romans and the followers. You're able to not only see the tension that exists between the Romans and the followers of Jesus, you're able to see the tension in the chosen between the followers of Jesus themselves because of different race and ethnic. And, and so Jesus brought a bunch of people together that didn't tr traditionally get along. Okay, That's the kind of the way that he worked. The church of Jesus has always been intended to be a diverse group of people. Always. From the very beginning, it was God's intention to bring different kinds of people together and make them one. From the beginning, this was always his, his vision. And so what we're going to look at today, is we're continuing our walk through the book of Acts, and we have come up on Acts 10, and we're going to look at a really, really important move in the Bible today, because for the first time, when you get to Acts 10, the gospel of Jesus is going to go to the non-Jew. It's going to go to the Gentile. Gentile just means anybody that's not a Jew, okay? Jesus was a Jew. His apostles were Jews. <clears throat> the gospel started with the Jews, but now it's going to move off from the Jews into the Gentiles. That's good news for us because we're Gentiles. We would not be here today uh, connected to God if it were not for God's grace of, of giving us his instruction and his word. It, it started here in Acts 10. There's five essentials we're going to look at in the next, uh, this week and next week to make God's diversity dream come true. And if I'm going to be part of making God's diversity dream come true, I need to, number one, realize that God has always dreamed of a diverse kingdom. I need to realize that God has always dreamed of a diverse kingdom. You've got some notes in your bulletin. Uh, I would encourage you to pull those out because it's going to have all the scriptures we're going to look at on there. It's also got a space for you to write some things down. What we do is we take these notes and then we take them to our small groups that we have that meet throughout the week. And we go over these uh, in our small groups. We talk about how to apply this stuff to our lives. Um, God's plan has always involved blessing all people. Uh, Abraham is considered the father of the Jewish faith. He's also considered the father of the Islamic faith. Uh, if you look at what God promised Abraham way back in Genesis, you can see that God's plan was never to have a monogamous church. It was never to have a monogamous, monogamous people. It was always to be diverse. It says in Genesis 22, all the nations of earth will be blessed by your offspring. This is part of God's promise to Abraham. God's vision for Abraham is I'm going to make you into a nation that's going to bless the whole earth. Abraham is the one that brings Jesus into the world. Has Jesus been a blessing to the earth? Has Jesus been a blessing to all people? Jesus' door is open to all people. You guys realize that? He doesn't say you've got to be a certain color to come in here. It's open to all people. All people are created in the image of God. God loves all people. He doesn't care what color you are. He doesn't care what nationality you are. He doesn't care how much money you have. He loves you. And this was always his vision. It's going to be for everybody. It's not going to be for one color or one race or one group. It's going to be for everybody. All the nations of earth are going to be blessed by your offspring. That's Old Testament. Now you get to New Testament. How do we see this in the New Testament? Well, in the Great Commission... When Jesus comes and he's giving his final instructions to his disciples before he goes to heaven, he says in Matthew 28, Jesus said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now let me pause there. He says, I've been given all authority and he's about to tell them something that was going to be hard. Because the Jews had never been instructed to go to the Gentiles ever. But he's going to say, I've got all the authority, I've got all the authority in heaven and on earth, and here's my command, go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. He doesn't say, go just to this group of people over here and don't tell their neighbors. He says, go to all people everywhere. In some uh, translations, it says, go to all nations. That's the word ethnos. 
Go to all people groups. Go everywhere. That just means ethnos, just means everybody. Go to everybody. Tell everybody about me. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what country they come from. I don't care how much money they make. Just tell them about me. Make disciples. Everybody. That's Jesus' command. So Old Testament, I'm going to bless everybody. New Testament, I want you to go to everybody. What is it going to look like in the future? What's the church going to look like in the future? Well, in Revelation, we get a picture of what God's church is going to look like. It says in Revelation 7, I looked again, I saw a huge crowd, too huge to count. This is John's vision of the church now. Everyone was there, all nations and tribes, all races and languages. Let me read that again. All nations and tribes, all races, all languages. What's the church made up of? All nations, all tribes, all races, all languages. It's not monogamous. It's not all one color. It's diverse. It's a tapestry. It's this mosaic that God brings together to form this beautiful picture. It's a diverse group. All nations, all tribes, all races and languages. And they were standing dressed in white robes and waving palm branches, standing before the throne of the Lamb. This is a picture of the church. This is a picture of the real church. This is a picture of the church as it is and the picture of the church as it's going to be. Do you want to be part of Jesus' church? You better not be a racist. You better not be a racist. If you're a racist, you don't fit in in the church because you don't share God's values for people. If you're a racist, you don't fit in in heaven. You're going to go to heaven and look around and say, what am I doing here with these people? You don't belong there. You better change your heart if you're a racist. Because your values don't match the values of heaven. This is not what the church might look like, guys. This is what the church is. And when I get together, 50 years ago, Martin Luther King, 50 years ago, Martin Luther King said 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in the United States. 50 years ago. As of 2001, as recently as 2001, 87% of the churches in the United States are still one color. Nearly 90%. 50 years after Martin Luther King makes this statement, 50 years later, nearly 90% of churches in the United States are still one color, statistically, white or black. Guys, that's not what the church looks like. That's not what the church looks like. You want to know what the church looks like? It's diverse. The church is diverse. This this is not typical. What we see here is not typical. Guys, this should be typical. This is the kingdom of God. When I look around, I see a lot of different colors this morning. Why? Because that's what the kingdom of God looks like. Because the gospel is for everybody. It's not for one color. It's not for one race. Racism and prejudice and looking down on people, that has no place in the kingdom of God. No place. We live in St. Louis, man. We're 15 minutes from Ferguson. You think the world doesn't need some healing? You think the world doesn't need some people to stand up and say it shouldn't be like this? Love one another, man. That's what the kingdom of God is meant to be. It's about love. You need to ask yourself regarding the issue of race. Do my values, words, and actions distort what God is like? Or do my values, words, and actions show people what God is like as it pertains to race? We've got to show the world something different. If I follow Jesus, it's my job to show the world something different. And the world needs something different. Amen? The world needs Jesus. Secondly, If I'm going to be part of making God's diversity dream come true, number two, I need to reject my current lens in favor of the lens of Christ. I need to reject my current lens in favor of the lens of Christ. What I mean by that, it's like uh, if you put on a pair of glasses, they got a lens, right? Have you ever uh, been driving down the road wearing dirty sunglasses? That's no fun, right? You want them things clean. You want to be able to see clearly. Uh, what about those colored lenses? You ever put the colored lenses on? The ones that brighten everything's up, you know, like make you go blind. Then you got those that are really dark, the UV protection, right? It affects your vision when you put them things on. Everything, you're kind of seeing it through this lens. We can do that with the way we think. 
we can look at people through a worldly lens where we don't see them the way God sees them. We see them the way worldly people see them. We make judgments based on uh, appearance or based on finance or based on whatever. Um, we don't look at the heart. When God looks at people, guys, what does God see when he looks at us? Does he see the outer shell? Does he get hung up on the hairstyle or the, the clothes? No, he looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. When God looks at us, he's looking at us through a lens that's a lot different than the lens that I might wear in my worldly thinking, right? He's looking at us very, very differently than we look at ourselves. Uh, in the book of Acts now, God wanted to connect Peter, who was a leader in the church, one of, one of the preeminent apostles, right? One of Jesus' close friends. He wanted to connect Peter, who knew Jesus, to Cornelius, who does not know Jesus. He's a pagan, but he is a God-fearer. So even though he didn't completely know Jesus, like this guy is praying to God, he's giving to the poor, he's being kind to the Jewish people, and Cornelius was a powerful Roman officer. This was not normal behavior. Romans typically treated Jews really, really badly. But this guy in this powerful position decides, even though he doesn't really know Jesus, he's going to start trying to be nice to, to the Jews because he, he just wants to honor God. He had learned about God somewhere along the way, and he likes God. He's not following these Roman gods. He's following the real God. Weird, okay? This is not a normal Roman. But when Peter hears that there's this Roman that God wants him to connect with, okay, Peter has a lens that he's going to be looking at people through. It says in uh, Acts 10, it says at Caesarea, verse 1, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. Cen century, or cen century means 100. A centurion, it means you were in charge of 100 men. That's what a Roman, you were a Roman officer in charge of 100 men. So Cornelius is a powerful Roman officer. He's got dudes that follow his command. If you were a Roman officer, if you told a soldier to go jump off a cliff, guess what they would do? They would go jump off the dang cliff. They would just do what you said. Like they were, they were like your robots. So you were really, really powerful if you had that, uh, that kind of clout. And the world that Cornelius lived in would have been a lot different from the one Peter lived in. Now, how would Peter have naturally viewed Cornelius? Remember, he's looking at him through a lens. Well, Cornelius, a centurion, was a pagan Roman oppressor. Pagan means he worshipped many gods. Uh, the Romans uh, believed in many gods. They actually believed in them. So the Greeks, just a side note, uh, they came up with Mars, Jupiter, like all the different, uh, the pantheon, you know, that we think of, of, of Roman and Greek gods. The Greeks didn't really believe in those gods. They knew that they were made up. They were just made up stories, right? The Romans, a few hundred years later, they didn't think they were made up. Like by the time you get to the first century, the Romans genuinely believed that Zeus was real. They believed Hercules was real. All the myths they, they thought were factual. And they would treat you, if you didn't believe that stuff, badly because the Romans believed the gods were capricious and mean. And if you didn't sacrifice to them, they would cause natural disasters to come on your town. So if there's an earthquake, well, who's not sacrificing to the gods? Oh, those Jews and Christians, let's take them and kill them. You know, you were blamed if something bad happened because the gods caused it to happen, and the gods caused it to happen because these guys over here aren't worshiping the gods right. So that's where a lot of the persecutions came from. So Peter, when he hears Cornelius, he's thinking centurion, he's, he's a pagan, he worships many gods, uh, he's a bad guy right off the bat, right? Now, none of that was true about Cornelius, but this is what Peter would have assumed. Um, they typically treated Jews really, really bad. So that was another thing that would have been on his mind. All this would have culminated in Cornelius being a person to be avoided. That's the next blank on your notes. Cornelius was a person to be avoided because Jews were not supposed to associate with Gentiles. Now, typically, uh, 
when it came to visiting a Gentile's home, if you were a Jew, you just didn't do that because it was a sin. Because you had to break law from the Bible to go do that. Like there were all these things that they had to take into account uh, about cleanliness and, and all kinds of stuff that we don't think about. Um, so why did Peter have this view? Well, it was taught. What I mean by that is many of his views about the Gentiles came from the Old Testament. They came from the Bible. Okay? His practice, and, and they had all these dietary laws. Jews, practicing Jews in the first century had a lot of really restrictive dietary laws. By dietary, I just mean like the way you eat food. So they had to prepare food a certain way. Uh, they could only eat certain food if the food was not prepared in the way that they considered clean. Uh, they could not eat it. Now, this sounds weird to us guys, okay? Uh, if you have not studied this before, this will not have the impact on you. But guys, um, Jews in the first century would die before they would break the food laws. There are accounts where uh, uh, they got into battles and, and like had sieges laid against them where they, had, they were cut off from the food they could eat. They had unclean food available to them. The Jews chose instead to die. This happened more than once instead of eating unclean food. Whenever we say, uh, whenever we bring up the food stuff, guys, this is, a lot of this is just lost on us. I'll just tell you, we didn't grow up Jewish. We didn't grow up having to worry about, uh, you know, how, how is eating this going to affect my relationship with God? Like, we, we just don't think that way. But this would have been something Peter grew up every single day thinking about. Uh, there were all these laws and all these customs he had to follow. And uh, so it was taught. You know, all that was taught from the Bible. Another part of Peter's view was caught. And what I mean by that is Peter would have been affected by the culture around him. Now, growing up a Jew, uh, do you think Peter, as a little kid, ever heard somebody talk about a Gentile around him? Yeah. Let me tell you, when I was growing up, uh, I remember I grew up in South. I grew up in, in Arkansas, right? Uh, Arkansas is not typically associated with uh, positive race relations. It's usually associated with negative race relations. It's a pretty racist uh, part of the world when you get down there, especially it pertains to whites and blacks. I grew up in a culture that was racist. I remember as a four-year-old kid, I'm a hunter, I remember going to the deer camp with my dad, and I remember hearing the other old men down in South Arkansas the way they would talk. And there was another deer camp right up the road from ours that was the, a lot of black guys, and I remember hearing the way they would talk about that other deer camp as a four-year-old little kid. They called it the N-word camp. That's what they called it. That's how they referred to it. Now, I never heard my dad or mom ever use any language like that, but I did hear other people using it. And as a four-year-old little kid, I picked up on it. And I one time repeated that word in front of my dad. One time. Guess what happened? That got corrected. And my dad let me know, we don't talk that way. These other men may talk that way. We do not talk that way. That's what my dad taught me as a little kid. And so I grew up um, hearing that from my dad. But guys, I, it still had an effect hearing that from others around me. It wasn't just the deer camp. It was my neighbors. It was kids I went to school with. Uh, I was affected by the racist culture around me where I became a racist, like as a, as a kid. I did. I just wanted to fit in. Now, that changed later, but I just wanted to fit in. Just, just making the point, guys, a lot of our views as it pertains to race and people, we pick up from our families or from people that have influence on us. And you just need to recognize if you've grown up in a family uh, that is full of racists, you are probably a racist because that's the environment that you grew up in. And you've got to take those feelings and those thoughts back to Scripture and say, okay, now if you're trying to follow God, You've got to take those thoughts and those feelings back and say, hey, how does this jive with what I'm learning about Jesus? And if your feelings about race distort what God says about it, you are in the wrong. You need to change. You have got to change your attitude. 
how did God view Cornelius? Okay, now here's the question, because Peter would have had all of these preconceived notions about Cornelius. At the end of the day, whose viewpoint matters? God's does, right? God's is the one that matters. And Peter had a different view than God did. He just didn't realize it yet. So how did God's view <coughs> How did God's view differ from Cornelius? It's really important to realize that if my view is different from God's, I'm the one that's wrong. And here's what God says in Acts 10 about Cornelius. Cornelius and his family were good people and honored God. He gave much money to the people and prayed always to God. One afternoon about 3 o'clock he saw in a dream what God wanted him to see. An angel of God came to him and said, Cornelius... He was afraid as he looked at the angel. He said, what is it, Lord? The angel said, your prayers and your gifts of money have gone up to God, and he has remembered them. Send some men to the city of Joppa and ask Simon Peter to come here. He's living with Simon, the man who works with leather. His house is by the seashore. He will tell you what you must do. The angel left him. Then Cornelius called two of his servants and a religious soldier who took care of him. He told what had happened, then he sent them to Joppa. So how did God view Cornelius? Well, God viewed him as a good man. You know, it's a good thing if your name shows up in the Bible and then right next to it it says he was a good man. That's good. You want that. That's good, right? He was a good man. He was a leader of his family. He was a guy that cared about others. Whenever Peter comes to visit him in a little bit, it's not just going to be him. It's going to be him and all his loved ones too because he wanted all of them to share in this. He's a God-honoring man. He's a man that cared about the Lord. He prayed to the Lord. He, he thought about the Lord. He apparently was in the scriptures, right? He cared about this. He was a giver. It says that he gave to the poor and that his offerings came up to God as a, as a, as a, as a sweet fragrance, fragrance, right? God liked it. He was prayerful. He was submissive and he was obedient. Man, what a contrast to what Peter probably thought about Cornelius when he first heard about this pagan who wanted to follow God. God views him as a person to be pursued, not avoided. That's God's view of Cornelius. What a contrast. Now, this guy is outstanding. He's a man of faith. His faith is incredible. It's incomplete because of ignorance. He needs to learn the rest. But, man, it's incredible. The problem here is Peter's not going to get close enough to him to help him. God looks down from heaven and he sees Cornelius who is trying desperately to follow him. He says, there's something special about this guy. He doesn't even know Jesus. And look at him. Look at him go. I'm going to connect Peter to him. There's just one problem. Peter doesn't want to get anywhere close to him because he stinks. He's a Gentile, right? You're not supposed to get to him. So God intervenes in this guy's life, he intervenes supernaturally in Peter's life because he knows Peter is going to have to change his view. He's going to have to change the lens that he's looking through to see Peter. Now, some of you this morning, if you struggle with prejudice, if you struggle with racism, if uh, every time you see something on the news or whatever, it just makes you lose your mind or get angry or get an attitude or whatever, you may need to change your lens. If you are looking at the world through a worldly lens, if you allow yourself to look down on people, if you think that you are better if you think that you are more enlightened, if you find yourself looking down your nose at anybody, you may need to change your lens. And if I'm going to change my lens, well, what did Peter have to do? The first thing Peter had to do is trust God. Because who was, who was challenging his viewpoint here? Well, it's God. God says this man's good, he's this, he's this, he's this. Peter was going to have to trust God, that God knew what he was doing. Anybody in here ever, ever, uh, you ever try to advise God on what he should do next? Is it just me, right? Um, yeah, we've got to learn to trust God. If, if God says to do it, 
if God says it's right, we got to trust him. Uh, secondly, we're going to have to learn to adopt God's view of people because that's what Peter had to do here. He had this view of Cornelius uh, that was not right. He was looking at him through a worldly lens. God does not look at people like that. God looks at people and he looks at the heart. He does not look at the outer shell. We have got to become people who develop eyes like God. Because if we can look past that outer shell and start seeing people the way God sees them, we're going to see a whole lot more than race. We're going to look right past it, guys. You will learn as you work with people, it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what color you are. People are people, man. And God loves them all, and everybody has a chance. But if we're going to reach them, we've got to trust God, and we've got to adopt God's view of them. Third, if I'm going to be part of God's diversity, if I'm going to be part of making God's diversity dream come true, uh, number three, I need to replace stubborn pride and embrace humble obedience. I need to replace st stubborn pride and embrace humble obedience. Um, where racism is present, pride always exists. Because one group thinks they're better than another. That's all it is. The Jews thought they were better than the Gentiles. The Gentiles thought they were better than the Jews. And, and you've got this pride that's there. We've got to repent of ethnic and racial pride. Uh, Peter is going to have a real big problem going to talk to a Gentile because of all the reasons we've listed here. He just had a, he's going to have a problem, and God wants him to, so God is going to give Peter an extra push to get him to go see Cornelius. The way this plays out in the book of Acts is God gives Peter a vision, and he tells him three times what to do. Um, let's just take a look at this. In Acts 10, 9 through 16, it says, The next day they went on their way. About noon, they were coming near the town. At this time, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became very hungry and wanted something to eat. While they were getting food ready to eat, he saw in a dream things God wanted him to see. In the NIV, I think it says he fell into a trance. Now God's going to give him a vision. It says in 11, he saw heaven open and something like a large linen cloth being let down to earth by the four corners. On the cloth were all kinds of four-footed animals and snakes of the earth and birds of uh, the sky. <coughs> a voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill something and eat it. Peter said, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything that our law says is unclean. The voice said a second time, what God has made clean, you must not say is unclean. Let me read that one more time. What God has made clean, you must not say is unclean. You might want to underline that. That's an important line right there. This happened three times. Then it was taken back up to heaven. What God has made clean, you must not say is unclean. Did you guys know God can take unclean stuff and make it clean? Did you guys know that? God can take unclean stuff and make it clean. When I read the Old Testament, I read all this stuff about clean and unclean. You know, I don't, I don't use that type of language, but for the Jews, that was language they used all the time. It's from the beginning in their law, clean and unclean. A big part of God's message to us is he can take the unclean, and what can he do with it again? Oh, okay. So God is in the cleanliness business. You ever felt dirty? You ever done something and known it was wrong and then it persists the guilt? You just kind of carry it with you. You can have dirty become part of your identity. I know because I was sexually abused when I was a little kid. Whenever stuff like that happens to you, uh, you tend to internalize the message that you're bad and you're dirty and you're unlovable. A lot of people that struggle with addiction are struggling with addiction because they're self-medicating a deep hurt. And that deep hurt is that they've bought into the lie that I'm dirty and I'm unclean. And so I medicate. I might medicate through sex. I feel really, really bad. I want to feel better. So I'm going to go sleep with somebody to make myself feel better for this moment because 
at least I'll feel better in this moment. And you go through life thinking you're unclean. You walk through day to day. You don't say it, you don't say it to anybody because that's shameful. Like, I feel like a piece of trash. Why would I say that to somebody? I'm just going to internalize that and keep it to myself. And I'm just going to go through life. And I'm going to make it. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to raise my kids. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I need to do. But deep down inside, I feel like a piece of crap. Deep down inside, I feel like I shouldn't be loved. Deep down inside, I feel like I'm never enough. Deep down inside, I feel unclean. Unclean. That's a good word to kind of encompass all that garbage. Unclean. Unclean like the lepers. They used to yell that when they had to walk through. Keep everybody away from them. Unclean. Keep away from me. Don't come close. Unclean. We feel that way sometimes, but we don't say it. We just kind of hide it. But we feel that way. I want to call your attention back. What God has made clean, you must not say is unclean. God is in the business of making the unclean clean. He told Peter, eat, eat. Eat three times. Peter's response, no, Lord. When I say no, Lord, it means I've got no, Lord. If I say Jesus is my Lord, but I'm only going to do what I want, that's not my Lord. <laughs> that's, that's in name only. Uh, pride is just an attitude that says I know better. Uh, guys, to God, this is dangerous. For us, this is dangerous. Uh, all of God's instruction is, is for our good. Every bit of his instruction is to bless us. All of God's instruction is for our good. When we say no to God, we're, we're hurting ourselves. When I say no, Lord, I'm hurting myself. I'm hurting others. Um, we can't do that. Now, I want to give Peter a little bit of grace here. He says no, Lord, but this is a new movement that God is making this is literally uh, God saying those, those commands in the Old Testament don't apply anymore. Uh, the Old Testament Mosaic law was made obsolete when Jesus died on the cross. And we're not going to get into that. The Bible says that. Um, but this was a huge, significant movement in the story of the Bible. God is telling Peter to do something new here, which is to go and... We're not going to follow those old laws anymore. Those are gone. I want you to go and I want you to interact with this man and I want you to lead him to me. Um, Peter's going to meditate on this vision that he gets, right? He says uh, in, in Acts 10, 17, Peter thought about the meaning of the dream. The men that Cornelius had sent came. They were standing by the gate asking about Simon's house. They called to ask if Simon Peter was staying there. Peter was still thinking about the dream when the Holy Spirit said to him, See, three men are looking for you. Get up, go down and go with them. Do not doubt if you should go because I sent them. Peter went down to the men who had been sent by Cornelius. He said, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, Cornelius sent us. He is captain and a good man. He honors God. The whole Jewish nation can say this is true. That's crazy. Uh, because he would have taken heat from his peers if the Jewish nation was saying this about him, right? Uh, an angel from God told him to send for you. He asked you to come to his house. He wants to hear what you have to say. Peter asked them to come in and stay with him for the night. The next day he went to them. Some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The next day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was looking for them. He had gathered all his family and close friends at his house. Now, isn't that cool? Does that tell you something about Cornelius? He brings all his family and friends over because God has showed him in a vision Peter's going to come visit. He wanted everybody. He wanted everybody to get in on this, right? So he brings all his loved ones there. 25, when Peter came, Cornelius got down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up and said, get up, I'm just a man like you. This is the proper response when people bow down to kiss your ring. Don't do that, I'm not God. That's what Peter says, right? Uh, Peter raised him up and said, get up, I'm just a man like you. As Peter spoke with Cornelius, 
he went into the house and found a large group of people gathered together. Peter said to them, you know, it is against our law for a Jew to visit a person of another nation. Look at this. But God has shown me I should not say that any man is unclean. You might want to underline that. God has showed me that I should not say that any man is unclean. For this reason, I came as soon as you sent for me. But I want to ask you why you sent for me. Cornelius said four days ago at three o'clock in the afternoon, I was praying here in my house all at once. I saw a man standing in front of me. He had on bright clothes. He said to me, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and has remembered your gifts of love. You must send to Joppa and ask Simon Peter to come here. He is staying at the house of Simon, the man who works with leather. His house is by the seashore. I sent for you at once. You have done well to come. We are all here and God is with us. We are ready to hear whatever the Lord has told you to say. Do you see how God orchestrated this? Uh, this is such a beautiful story. God looks down from heaven and he sees Cornelius, this guy who is worshiping him in the midst of a culture where it would have been very unpopular for him to do so. That's not what Romans did. Not only did he worship God, this guy loved the Jewish people to the point that word got out about him among the Jews. This Roman centurion is kind to us, right? This man spends time in prayer. This man gives gifts to the poor. This man doesn't know Jesus Christ. Are Cornelius' sins forgiven? At that point, no. No, they weren't. He's still in his sin. Is he clean? Is Cornelius clean in his sin? Are you guys confused? Can you go to heaven without your sins forgiven? Can you live in your sin and be right with God? No, you've got to have that sin taken care of. You've got to have that sin taken care of. Cornelius is in his sin. Guys, my point is Cornelius is unclean. He's doing good. He's trying to do right, but he's unclean. God looks down and he sees him. What does God have the power to do? God has the power to take the unclean and make it clean. He has the power to take death and turn it into life. He has the power to take sickness and turn it into health. He has the power to do all kinds of cool stuff. He's got to get involved though, right? But God looks down from heaven. He sees this Cornelius, this unclean man. And he says, I want to make that man clean. I want to make that man clean. I'm going to go out of my way to make that man clean. This man, I'm going to send Peter to him. And I know Peter's not going to want to, so I'm going to kick Peter in the butt and make him. And I'm going to, I'm going to take care of this man and his family. Guys, who got saved as a result of this? We haven't, read, we haven't gotten to it yet, okay? We're going to finish this out next week. Jake's going to finish uh, this lesson. But what's going to happen is Cornelius is going to become a Christian. And not only is Cornelius going to become a Christian, his whole family is going to become a Christian. And what's going to happen, guys, in Acts 10, there's a big move in Acts 10. So big move in Acts 2, big move in Acts 8, big move in Acts 10. In the very beginning, Jesus says the gospel is going to start in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit's going to be poured out in Jerusalem. It's going to go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and then it's going to go to the ends of the earth. It says that in Acts 1.6 or 1.7. So what you see is in Acts 2, Jerusalem. Acts 8, Judea and Samaria. Acts 10, we're going to start going to the ends of the earth. And that's how the gospel spreads. And every time you see one of those moves, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, ends of the earth, you see a special move of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts where God does something new. And here we see God doing something new with Cornelius because this is the first time God is going to send a Jew to a Gentile, the unclean Gentile, the unclean Gentile, the un savable Gentile. If you are walking through earth feeling unclean, 
If you are going through life feeling unclean, if you are here today feeling unclean, you are in the presence of God who makes the unclean clean. But you want to know what we have to do to become clean? We got to be washed. We got to be washed. And guys, we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can make us clean. If you want Jesus in your life, you've got to start listening to him and obeying him. And if you're going to start listening to him and obeying him, you're going to need some help. Because none of us really can do that very well on our own. So that's what the church is all about. Jesus' idea was this. The church. The church was his idea. Uh, he knew that we were going to need one another if we were going to be okay because this world is so jacked up and broken. He knew that we were going to need a family. And so when you decide to become a Christian, guys, this idea that it's me and God, that is so foreign. Like this idea that my, my, my faith is just about me and God, man, that is foreign to Scripture. Scripture is about family. The, the, the church of Jesus is about family. Getting right with Jesus and getting right with God is about family. You need help. You need other people. You need brothers and sisters in your life. That's what the church is for. So what God does is he says, if you want to follow me, I want you to make a commitment to do so. And I'm going to give you the gift of my spirit. I'm going to actually come and my spirit's going to dwell within you. And I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm going to give you the gift of the spirit. And then I'm going to walk with you. And I'm going to help you join this family called the church. And you're going to have brothers and sisters. And you're going to function as a family. And, and that's how life is going to be great. You guys get together and you have relationships the way they were always intended. You're calling one another higher. You're encouraging one another. You're confessing sin. You're comforting each other. You're taking care of needs. You were never meant to do this alone. But what God wants to do, if you are here today feeling unclean, God wants to cleanse you. God wants to make you clean. God wants to wash your sins away. God wants to get you right with him. And then God wants to plug you into a family of people where you can turn around and share that joy with others. Because this is not something we were ever designed just to keep to ourselves. Your faith is not just about you and God. Your faith is about you and God, and it's about everybody God wants to use you to bless. Because there are a lot of people that God loves and he wants to use you as his hands and feet to show them that love. Whenever you give your life to Jesus, whenever you go from unclean to clean, God then takes you and uses you as an agent of cleanliness in the world. Where you go out and, and you spread that to others, to anybody that will have it. You want to spread that to others. Guys, we don't force our views on anybody. You can't force anybody to come to faith. But what we can do is be bold about what we believe. We can be bold in being kind and compassionate. We can be bold in proclaiming the truth. And, 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 and we can just love folks, guys. And, and all the ones that, that, that are touched by that, that want to respond to God, guys, we can just make, make it as easy for them as possible. And that's really what we try to do here at the, at the church. Uh, if you're here visiting for the first time, um, uh, I want to say a special welcome to you. And I also want to invite everybody, visitors and guests alike, to pull out a co uh, communication card. That's a cardstock piece of paper in your bulletin. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close out this morning. But I want to invite you to look that communication card over uh, because we do have a lot of different things that we offer, uh, either support services or different things. If you're interested in a relationship with God, mark on your card that you'd like a personal Bible study, and we will have somebody follow up with you. <coughs> if you um, would like to join the church, indicate that, please. We would love to talk with you more about that. We also are a church of small groups here. Um, most of the stuff that we do that is really good uh, is done because of our small group ministry. It's in there that you're able to really get to know people. It's good getting together on Sundays in a big group, but uh, small groups uh, meet in homes, and that's really where you can get to know people and get to make friends, and people can really get to know your story. Uh, so I want to encourage you to plug in if you haven't done that already. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then uh, we are going to wrap up. 
Uh, after my prayer, we're going to sing a song, and that's going to give you an opportunity to fill your card out. Then we'll sing one more song after that and pass some baskets, and you can just drop your card in that basket. Uh, but I do want to encourage you to respond because, uh, man, anytime we open up the Word of God, uh, it's an opportunity for us to apply it to our lives. And uh, I know there's, there's some of you in here that are just kind of investigating a relationship with the Lord. And so I just want to encourage you to take that next step uh, in your progress. And, uh, and let's, let's give everything we can to Jesus. Because honestly, guys, that's, that's how you can have the best life. Let me pray for us and we're going to close. Uh, God, I want to thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the story about Cornelius in Acts 10. Uh, it's encouraging, God, and it's, it's, it's encouraging to remember that you're a God that takes the unclean and makes it clean. If we're here today and we're feeling unclean, help us to understand we've got an opportunity for something different. It's scary to change. It's scary to ask for help. It's scary. Um, God, it's scary to, to, to let you in because we're letting go of control. I remember before I became a Christian, clinging to that control and putting off the decision to give my life to you because I was afraid. Help me and all of us to get over our fear. Help us to trust you completely. Help us to give you control, understanding you're the God that makes the unclean clean. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. How do you explain?